The next game that caught my eye from round nine at the FIDE Chess.com Grand Swiss was this knight versus bishop battle between Nijad Abasov and Saryan Sigoryev. Now, these two guys are rising stars, very, very strong chess players from Azerbaijan and Russia, respectively. But this particular game had a lot of weird decisions made in terms of how to handle the dynamics between your knight and rook and your rook and bishop. And we learned something from it, both from the perspective of how it's done well and maybe the opportunities that were missed. In this position as it stands, we can see that black is actually up a pawn. Combine that with the fact that whenever you have pawns on both sides of the board, theory says that the rook and bishop should probably be the better duo. Why? Because they can work together in a long distance fashion. Often if the bishop gets open and gets centralized, working with the rook is just a more of a powerful dynamic than what the rook and knight can generate. Now the one exception to those types of evaluations or general statements is if the rook and knight can work in close proximity. And what we mean by that is obviously the knight is a short range piece. So if it can usually stay close to the rook, perhaps near a target of great value, that's when the rook and the knight can be at their best. And in this particular game, Abasov does a good job of continuing to keep the threats of a mating net alive. And that's a very good example of how we should think about playing that duo if we're ever stuck with a knight and rook versus a rook and bishop. So on that note, let's jump in and see what exactly happened. Obviously, king h7 is forced, and now we have equality in terms of material. More importantly, white is actually threatening h5, which would then be rook h8 with checkmate. Because of that, black ran out with the king. White backs up with check, and now black plays the accurate move king f6, not king to f5. The reason is that even though we might think we want the more active king, bringing the king to f6 actually prevents the move knight to d7 because of king to e7. Why is that important? Because if you had gone to f5 right away, the best move is knight to d7 here, with the main point being that things like rook d2 actually blundered a g4 and a discovered check on the rook. And if you don't play rook d2, other things like rook b1 check and king h2, Eventually, I'm bringing the rook to f8. We see maybe my knight comes back to g6, pushing your king into some really dangerous territory. Things like rook b5 will allow f3, and I have both e4 and g4 mating net ideas. So <clears throat> it was kind of tricky for me to understand why would you play king of 6 instead of king of 5, which is why I spent time on it. And I think that that was the key, was that he wanted to play king of 6 to both stop knight d7 and to induce the next move f4 so that now he can go f5 and he actually does have an escape square. So High level shuffling there, that's already instructive. Now we see the move knight to d3. Now, even though this move is not objectively best, and I spent some time analyzing the move knight c4 over at my blog, you can check out, it's what the engine likes. I actually really like knight d3. From a practical point of view, I think that this is one of the moves that helped him win the game. The reason is that when the knight comes to f2, you're now renewing your control over the escape squares of the king. And when the knight and rook are going to outplay the rook and bishop, it has to be because of that mating net dynamic I talked about. So this idea of knight d3 followed by the move knight f2 is just something I really liked because I would be super scared to have this position as black. And guess what? Black was under time pressure in this moment. Now, again, I'm saying this as an analyzer, as an educator, someone who's giving advice on a practical technical level for anybody that wants it. But I, I, I'm aware that objectively black could have been okay here if he had played the move c5. Opening the bishop also is, is instructive for us anyway, because it's what you should do. From a principal point of view, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to me that Sigurdjof didn't play c5. It's the move that opens up your worst piece. Uh, it's a move that pushes your, your only pass pawn. And it's a move that would directly have kind of stopped the threats that white end up getting. So really hard to understand why c5 didn't happen, unless there was just a miscalculation. I think that one of the key points is that after h5, e5 is played. After rook f8, king e6, and rook e8, the main point is that king d7, rook takes e5, and then rook b1 and c4. Even though you've lost a pawn, this is actually a very scary position for white, because this is exactly the type of dynamic where the rook and bishop have kind of been given their platform to shine if we're talking about this dynamic of bishop versus knight. For example, if you just try to attack it, I might go rook b2, and if you move the knight, I get g2. If you go back, I have a draw. So, uh, maybe, maybe I don't think it was the case that Black wanted more. I think maybe it was just miscalculation or, or missing that. Again, there was a lot of time pressure. Um, of course, there's also a key line that could have been with g4 and then rook up. But the main point in this line is that Black has e5 in a lot of positions and doesn't get mated. So after knight f2, Black didn't play c5. He played e5. Well, here comes White's idea. g4, f5 check. And the main point is that after king g7, rook g8, and then rook b8, 
I'm trying to bring my knight back in, so you have to play c5 now, but here I come with knight d3, and now I'm hitting e5. This was Black's last chance, no longer to try to prove the rook and bishop are the better duo, but to bail out and realize he's misplayed this. He missed his chance to play c5 earlier and flex the rook and bishop muscles on the diagonals, the open files that we keep saying that duo needs. Instead, he plays the move king f6, giving the rook and knight exactly what they need, which is close proximity to the enemy king. The literal threat is rook e6 and knight takes e5 with lights out. Um, again, the only move that he had to bail out here was no longer rook and bishop proving it, but bailing out by playing the move c4, sacrificing a pawn to go to the rook ending. And the key point is that because you hit e3, after king f2, you have h5, simplifying everything and undermining the protection of this pawn. Most likely, this endgame should be a draw. So that would have been the last chance for black. He's already messed up rook and bishop being able to compete, but maybe he still could have had a draw. Instead, he played king f6, and after the move, rook e8, we see a very, very nice finish here, one worthy of a missed on the aisle highlight segment. Bishop to d5 allows knight takes e5. And after rook to, d, rook to b7, you can pause the video if you want. I'm not going to give you much time. e4. The whole point is we're trying to remove the bishop from the square e6, because that's pretty good. That's called checkmate. And if the bishop moves to another square, say as it did in the game, Right as the 40th move is reached, white wins on the spot with knight to d7. Black just resigns. The reason is it's mate in two, because after rook takes, we have e5 checkmate. Pretty painful to lose a game right at time control, right as you get more time on the clock, knowing you've probably misplayed the endgame because you didn't have a lot, a lot of room to think. Uh, that's a painful one, but still an instructive one for us. Just consider how the rook and knight shuffled and kept themselves together. Good to think about those tips ourselves in our own games if we're ever in that duo. And realizing that even at the cost of a pawn, he should have played c5 earlier to open this bishop because the longer you wait for your duo not to compete with the other duo, the more likely things go wrong. And uh, shout out to Abasov for outplaying black here in the knight versus bishop kind of imbalance. Thanks for tuning in. This is actually my last video on, for the Mist on the Isle segment. Breaking news here, I guess, if you're watching this on the live broadcast. Shout out to everybody there. I will be headed to our company's annual meetup, heading to the airport pretty much right after this. Um, so hope you enjoy these videos. If you haven't checked them all out, please go to our YouTube channel and do so. And if you're watching this on YouTube, back to the broadcast. Those on YouTube get reminded that they should go watch the broadcast with Danny and Anna because this is your last chance to find out who's going to take the spot in the candidates for a chance to challenge Magnus Carlsen. Again, it's been my pleasure to do these videos. Hope you read the blogs. There's a lot of stuff over there. Almost too much instructive analysis. I should probably get back to messing around more often. Uh, but uh, thanks for checking this out on whatever platform you chose to do it in. Please share it for us. Give us a like. Give us a sub. And we'll see you around on Chess.com.